All right, thank you very much, Yashe. All right, we will move on to our final speaker. Mm. His Highness Sheikh Sanusi Hamid II. Assalamu alaikum, Yashe. Hello? Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammadin ibn Abdullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in this um, extremely interesting and enlightening webinar. I've had um, the opportunity to listen to uh, great scholars um, and I'd like to um, thank them for this opportunity. Uh, Mufti Menk, uh, Sheikh Fantami, Ustaz Abakar Sadiq, Imam Ali Agan, Reverend Job, Pastor Washika, Nur Lemu, Reverend Monokwa, and other panelists. Um, I would like to thank you for uh, giving this issue the attention it deserved and covering it from the various perspectives of the two, uh, of the two religions. Um, I've been asked to speak about the contemporary challenges facing Sharia legislation on rape and domestic violence. And just to give a little bit of context to, to this topic, um, we know, for example, that we have at least 12 states in northern Nigeria that um, going back to 1999, 2000, 2001, uh, declared that they were adopting Sharia law. Uh, one of the most interesting things about these states when you look at them is that between 2000 and today, which is 20 years, uh, with the exception of the criminal law, none of these states has passed any Sharia law. Family law has not been codified. Um, um, law of contract has not been codified. And you end up with the impression that Sharia law is limited to amputating the hand of a thief, um, stoning an adulterer, whipping someone who's drunk um, alcohol, um, and, that is, and that's it. So all the other things around the family, around relations, around marital relations, around the age of marriage have been codified. Now, this was an issue for me. And I remember in 2014, when I became ABA, one of the first things I did was to set up a committee of religious scholars to try to codify a Muslim law of personal status. And it took us three years. Now, the reason this is important is for you to actually legislate in Nigeria on Sharia. As Sheikh Nur said, you have to involve the scholars. Sometimes you have to debate with them. Sometimes you have to force them to research. You have to force them to think. Sometimes you have to force them to look at what other Muslim countries have done, Malaysia, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, and try to explain to them that we are not the only Muslims in this world. How come the scholars in those countries have accepted these changes? How come we're not accepting them? Now, part of what I'm going to talk about on rape is to say, um, going back to, to that experience, how you use the classical Islamic law as a foundation, because you can't get rid of that, and how on that foundation, and based on that foundation, we can legislate for the contemporary world. What are the issues? Um, and also, um, from my experience in uh, the production of that Muslim family law, some of the things that perhaps we have been blind to, because sometimes the issue is not so much the people, it's not so much the scholars, it is actually something beyond that. So um, I'm supposed to speak about um, the legislation for rape, and some of that has been discussed uh, by, by Sheikh Nur. I'll try not to repeat uh, what has been said, other than to endorse and to say that I support uh, certainly everything that's been said by all the scholars that have spoken before me. Now, now, now rape, um, in classical Islamic jurisprudence has been looked at from two different perspectives. The vast majority of scholars have treated rape as an act of zina, which is adultery or um, uh, fornication, and also liwat, which is sodomy, accompanied by violence. Um, a minority have treated it as a case of heraba, which is uh, brigandage uh, similar to armed robbery, um, and I will come to that and the arguments that they have. Now, depending on where you classify rape, there are serious consequences and implications 
for things like the law of evidence and also the punishment. And the reason is that the Islamic law on adultery and fornication and the law of evidence is actually geared towards protecting the integrity of people mm -hmm. and protecting them from being falsely accused and slandered. And that is the reason, and because, and, and in fact, in the context of Surah Nu was a slander on Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the, the law of evidence, when it comes to fornication and adultery, is designed to make sure that only when you have absolute proof, incontrovertible proof, do you accuse anyone of committing adultery or fornication. And that's why you need four eyewitnesses or a voluntary confession, which can be detracted. In fact, some scholars say um, the, the confession must be given four times. And it's not just a confession to say, oh, I committed adultery. You must um, confirm that you actually penetrated. You must confirm that you knew it was illegal. You must confirm that you knew it was zina and all that, and that you were in your senses before you are convicted. Now, the problem with taking rape and treating it as zina with violence is that inadvertently, the rapist enjoys the protection that is given to um, an average human being whose reputation is being protected. On the other hand, if you took rape as heraba, the law of evidence is different, principally because that law is aimed at protecting the society from the aggression of criminals. And therefore, you do not protect the rapist, you protect the victim. Whereas if you took it as a case of zina, you would be protecting the rapist without meaning to. Now, the vast majority of Muslim scholars in the past uh, so the Hanafi scholars and the Hanbali scholars and some Shafi scholars um, treated rape as a case of zina with violence. Um, in Maliki law, um, certainly, um, and I think um, Sheikh Nur referred to Ibn Arabi, there's also Imam al-Qurtabi. And if you look at the commentaries on the text, if you look at Ulaish, Aminahul Jalid, if you look at um, Jasuki's, uh, Jasuki's Hashia and al Sheikh Kabir, in Maliki law, there is a very strong position that rape is a case of Hiraba. It is um, linked because at the end of the day, um, it, um, the, the underlying commonality is that somebody uses force or fear or intimidation to take away from people that which does not belong to him. It doesn't matter whether it is life um, or property or somebody's sexuality or somebody's dignity. So um, Hiraba as a crime um, is one that uh, um, also involves facade and the, uh, that's uh, causing corruption um, in the land. And therefore, uh, the Maliki position uh, fundamentally is that rape is seen as a case of Hiraba, as a case of transgression uh, or brigandage rather than as a case of, um, uh, of Zina. Now, what are the implications um, of that? Um, in Hiraba, you don't need four, four eyewitnesses. Uh, you need two witnesses. In Hiraba, one of the witnesses can be the victim. Therefore, if a woman is raped or a man is raped, their testimony is taken as that of a witness. If you do not have a witness to the act, you are allowed to have um, circumstantial evidence. This circumstantial evidence could be, for example, um, the, the girl screamed and somebody saw the person running away. Um, it could be um, some uh, semen that he left that goes through so, some um, tests in the lab and you establish that this semen belonged to him. Uh, it could be even that the person who is accused of raping has a history of bad behavior. All of these can be taken as corroboration to the testimony of the victim. Now, um, so the implications are very clear that if you take um, rape and link it to Hiraba, you are then able to lower the standards of proof and therefore get more and more of these criminals um, into the net. Uh, whereas if you uh, treat it as Zina, you provide opportunity for 99, in fact, 100% of rapists to, go, to get away 
because unless they confess, you're going to need four eyewitnesses. I remember that for Zina, you don't just need four people to say, I saw him on top of our, I saw naked people. These four people have to actually say they were eyewitnesses to the penetration. It's totally impossible. So, um, so I, I think the first thing is if we're dealing with contemporary, unfortunately we're in a Maliki jurisprudence. So if you are going to write a law um, under the Sharia, it is important I think to first of all, accept the Maliki position that rape is an act of Hiraba. And in that case, it doesn't really matter whether you have four eyewitnesses, no matter whether it confesses, the testimony of the victim along with circumstantial evidence would be sufficient to convict the rapist. If he confesses, that is fine. Even if he does not, um, um, th uh, these things are taken in, um, into consideration. That is the first thing. The second thing with Islamic jurisprudence is that in every discussion of rape, gasabo, iktisab, the victim is a victim. The rapist is a criminal. The victim is innocent. There has not been a single case I have seen where um, jurists say if um, a woman is raped, the judge should ask her if she was properly dressed or if she uh, tempted him or if she was in, 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 uh, in a place at night, you know? And I think it's extremely important. I mean, you can have a discussion around, um, you can have a discussion around uh, whether women dress properly, that's a different discussion. But when discussing the crime of rape, it is very clear. The rapist is the criminal. The, the woman or the man who are the victims of rape are victims. And just like Noor said, you don't ask a man who's been the victim of armed robbery why he was driving a Mercedes Benz at night. He should have dr driven a rickety car. And that's why you cannot ask a woman why she was dressed in a particular way. Um, and got, in any case, as has been said, women are raped, men are raped, young children are raped, adults are raped, old women are raped, hijabi women are raped. So there is nothing statistically um, that shows that rape is tied to, um, to that. A rapist uh, would probably, a, a person who would rape a naked, naked woman on the street would rape a hijabi woman if he had the opportunity to. And he probably might rape a boy as well. So um, uh, that I think is very clear in, under the law that in the law of rape, the raped person is a victim. We do not ask what they did wrong. It was the rapist who did, uh, who, who, who did wrong. Um, so, if um, we, when we start from moving from uh, uh, Zina uh, to Hiraba, uh, we have consequence in terms of the law of evidence and it's easier to establish rape. The second thing is also, uh, we now, the next stage is to say, what is the punishment uh, for, for Hiraba? And as uh, Nur said, Sura Tumaida, um, there are basically four options um, available uh, to the Qadi. There's, um, um, because the word says, uh, you either execute them, or you crucify them, or you amputate limbs from opposite sides, right, right, limb, uh, right, right arm and left leg, or left arm and uh, right leg, or you exile them or imprison them. So uh, in the 21st century, given our constitution, for example, uh, if we say we will not take, um, uh, we're, not, we're not going to um, crucify or we're not go going to amputate. In our laws today, we do have death sentences. In our laws today, we do have prison sentences. And these prison sentences can be anything from short sentences to long sentences to life imprisonment. Now, to my mind, uh, this gives us a great opportunity to look at rape to define to um, a law of evidence that acknowledges, that respects the testimony of the victim along with, uh, with circumstantial evidence that is purely consistent with, with Maliki law, and then to decide on a sentence that looks at the gravity of the particular situation. And what um, other Muslim countries have done is to define this gravity. So for example, a man who rapes um, a child who's under 12 years or under or under or under un, under 10 years old it, uh, a, a child is committing a much graver sin of rape aggravated ag aggravated rape rape than a man who rapes an adult a man who uh, or a person who has responsibility for protecting a child 
say a parent or a, a family relation or, um, or a driver who is supposed to take her to school or a cook who has access, a trusted person who takes advantage of that, commits rape, rape in an aggravated manner compared to somebody who is not entrusted with the protection um, of that child. Um, a man who commits rape and he, and while, while holding a weapon or accompanied by, by strong violence has an aggravated case of rape compared to one who does not apply such violence. Now that provides the basis, I think, in legislation for saying this is 10 years in prison, this is 20 years in prison, this is life imprisonment, this is a death sentence. And all of that will be consistent with the positions on Hiraba and, uh, and, and uh, Maliki jurisprudence. So um, uh, broadly speaking, I think th this is what would be uh, the, um, if, if, if I were to uh, uh, draft a law or talk to scholars on the law, these are the kinds of issues we need to look at taking inspiration from uh, um, classical jurisprudence. Uh, the, the second thing, of course, is this is about the rapist. Um, how about the person who is raped? Um, the, the position of Maliki law is that if, you, um, if a woman is raped, she's entitled to what's called mahar method, which is the, um, the, the, the dowry um, that is consistent with her status. Now, um, we have this problem, of course, in Nigeria, where the dowry, the mahar, is usually very small. Uh, 10,000 naira, uh, 20,000 naira, people give the minimum, the minimum dowry. The interesting thing is um, with Imam Malik himself, marital gifts where they're considered as essential to the marriage contract are actually taken as part of mahar. So really, if you want to estimate what should be the mahar for a woman, you'd be looking at in Northern Nigeria, not just the Mahar or the Sadak, we're looking at what we spend on what's called Kayan Zenchi, Kayan Lepi, all of that should just be added and therefore and in, in arriving at a financial compensation. And in any case, I think there would be a valid argument for saying that the fact that the scholars accepted payment of Mahar simply establishes the principle that a rape, that a victim of rape, in addition to the punishment for the rapist, the victim of rape is entitled to financial compensation. And we should then decide what is the appropriate financial compensation because the principle has already been established um, in, in jurisprudence. So, um, so uh, the, if, when, you, when you're legislating for rape, you would be looking at, is it Zina or Hiraba? And we would have to, I think, um, consider the implications um, of, because if you treat it as Zina, as I said, you protect the rapist. If you just as Hiraba, you protect the victim. Um, secondly, the um, standards of proof in Zina are much higher than standards of proof in Hiraba, and therefore taking to as Hiraba allows us to catch more of the victims. Um, uh, the the, the uh, options we have between death sentence and, and imprisonment give us the ability to have uh, legislation on punishment. Um, I, from imprisonment to death sentence, because I do think um, cases of men who marry five year, five, who, who uh, rape five year old girls, for example, they should just be executed. I mean, I, I don't see uh, any reason why they should even, uh, some of them should not even remain on the face of the earth, just execute them. And the law says um, it's here, Rabbi, and you can't tell you it's an option. So the death sentence can be applied to aggravated rape cases. And then long prison sentences can be um, uh, given to, uh, to, to other cases. Um, and finally, the financial compensation should be against such as to, um, uh, to, 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 be, uh, to be a deterrent. Um, so we, we do have the basis for, so you have, you go to prison and you pay, or you even have a death sentence and you pay because killing you or imprisoning you does not give the lady any benefit. And now we must also remember that you, um, the, in, in classical jurisprudence, the financial compensation is not just for the act of sex. If in the course of raping her, you cause her injury, there is an additional payment under criminal law, he says. You'll pay, you'll pay for injury, you'll pay for bodily harm. Now these are, um, th th these are I think the ingredients um, of a legislation around rape that is consistent uh, to my mind, with at least the Maliki, and it's not just Maliki. I mean, we've talked about Ibn Arabi and Qurtubi and uh, Olesh and um, and uh, Dasuki, but this is what you find with Imam Shaukani, Nello Altar. This is what you find in um, uh, with, with Ibn Hazm, 
uh, in um, in Al Muhalla. In fact, Ibn Hazm is perhaps the most articulate um, um, exposition of how rape fits into Hiraba. And he goes to the extent to say, look, Hiraba is not just about whether or not you're carrying a weapon, whether or not it, 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 can be, it can be in the forest, it can be on the streets, it can be in the city, it can be in a palace, it can be, it can be in a home. You know, um, you, you can carry an arm, you may not carry an arm, it could, be, it could involve taking money, it could involve taking life, it could involve taking honor, you know, all of that to him is Hiraba. And he says there is nothing in the Quran or Hadith that limits Hiraba to money. There's nothing in the Quran or Hadith that limits Hiraba to taking life. It is it, the use of fear, the use of intimidation, the use of power to take away from somebody something that they've given without their consent is sufficient for it to be Hiraba. Uh, and so um, we, we, we have, I think, um, enough resources. And, and this has always been my position. Uh, when we want to uh, make these legislations, we should always go back to classical jurisprudence, look hard, and we'll find that many things that we say um, uh, are, not, um, uh, are not there in law, are actually there, um, if, if, we, if, we know, if we know how to look and if we look very deeply um, into it. Uh, now, uh, the, the next question is, of course, uh, the question of um, marital rape um, and, and, and domestic violence, uh, which Noor has, has and, and I would like to uh, say that um, we need a little bit of nuance um, in this conversation. Um, when we define marital rape as having sexual intercourse uh, with your wife without her consent, you would run into a brick wall in Islamic law. And the reason is simple. Uh, the law says if you uh, if you go into a marriage marital relationship with your consent, that contract implies a consent to make your sexuality available to the husband. So by the time you agree to marry a man, you have given your consent for him to have sex with you. And this is the position of the scholars. Now, is this consent required in every single act of sex? If at a point in time your wife says, I am not interested in and you force her to have sex or you have sex with her, with her despite her saying she is not interested, what you have done is you have violated the sunnah. Okay, because there's a hadith of the prophet that says, do not approach your wives the way beasts approach each other. Get her consent. Now, but violating the sunnah is not a criminal offense. And I think we should make that distinction. It is wrong, but it is not a crime. However, if in the course of trying to have sex with her, you use violence or you cause bodily harm, that is domestic violence and it's a criminal offense. So the act of sex itself is not criminalized, even though having sex without her consent is wrong and it is a sin and it's a violation of the sunnah of the prophet and the instruction of the prophet. It is not a criminal offense, but accompanying that with violence and with bodily harm and with injury enables the wife to seek criminal compensation for violence. So I think it's extremely important to, um, to, make, to make that distinction. Um, so, so when people talk about marital rape, um, and, 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 and it's broadly defined as just having sexual intercourse with your wife without consent, um, I think we must make that distinction. Um, having sexual intercourse with your wife without her consent and without violence and assault is wrong under the sunnah. It is not a criminal offense. When it is accompanied by violence and injury, it is a criminal, a criminal offense. But the institution of marriage, the contract of marriage is a contract that allows the man and the woman access to each other's sexuality. Now you can of course think of a case of uh, possibly the woman herself raping a man. Yes, um, it may not be, um, a, a, it may be um, um, a lady-like thing to do, but it's not a crime, you know, it's, she has a right to do it, it's, you know, um, and that is really uh, the, way, uh, uh, the, the way the law, uh, the, the law has it. And I think um, one of the challenges that we have when we have these conversations is um, this, when you tell scholars you want to criminalize um, uh, 
marital rape, what, 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 what comes to their mind is you want to make it a crime for a man to have sex with his wife without, without a consent. So we need to, we need to make that, uh, that distinction. Now, um, this brings me to the issue of domestic uh, violence in general, and also the, the whole question of age of marriage and so on. And these are issues that we came across when we're trying to, to make the law. Um, now, take the case of age of marriage or wife beating. In, in, in Islamic jurisprudence, when, 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 when there's an, a statement, a, a command, as we know, um, a command can, or can, can be, um, it, could, it could just simply um, indicate, oh, this is something that, um, it, could, it, could, it could be something that um, is permissible. It could be something that is desirable. It could be something that is compulsory. So um, take marriage. Marriage is a sunnah. And marriage is desirable. In fact, in some cases, in the cases of in the case of um, a person who cannot control his sexual urges and was ability to ma to marry, it becomes um, even obligatory. Now, so marriage itself is sunnah. But marrying a woman at a particular age is a matter of choice. There is no value attached to it. It's just permissible. So nobody says that if you marry. Uh, someone at the age of six or seven, you have a higher reward than someone who marries a woman at the age of 18. And if you take the prophet's life, um, uh, even if you accept, um, and again, like Noor, I, I have serious reservations about the hadith on the age of Aisha, but if you accept um, uh, uh, those, uh, those reports that uh, you would find a whole range uh, of years at which he married when one of, one of them, a Khadija in one of the uh, narrations say that um, Khadija was um, married at the age of 40. So um, you, if you take it the sunnah, it can be all those ages. Now in usul al fiqh, there is a rule. This rule is called qaida taqiyid al mubah. It's a rule of placing limitations on that which is permissible. And the idea is if something is just permissible, not desirable and not obligatory, if it causes damage, the government can restrict it. So, for example, in Islamic law, the government of Nigeria cannot have a law that says you cannot marry because marriage is sunnah. But it can have a law that says you cannot marry a girl before a certain age because marrying a girl at a young age is just mubah, it's just permissible. It is not desirable, it is not compulsory. And that is, for example, when we started um, trying to write the law, my position was that we needed to have a minimum age of marriage. And this has been done in Morocco, it's been done in uh, uh, Malaysia, it's been done in Egypt, it's been done in Syria, it's been in other Muslim countries. We were not able to do that. And, and you know, we had a long conversation. The law, that, uh, the, the law we finally had had about 70, 80% of what I wanted. We didn't have 100%, but I was happy that we could get to 80%. And that we know we can also look at uh, uh, look, look at amendments. But, but, but in this conversation, I think we need to um, bring some nuance and some, and, and some detail in, into this analysis. You know, we keep talking about the age of marriage and, um, and, and I'm sure if you look at, um, say, the verse in Surah Al-Nisa, uh, you'll find that um, the, the, the different schools of law, when they talked about reaching the stage of marriage, gave a number of options. Some of them are the physical signs of puberty, but some of them also are using the age. And in, interestingly, in Maliki law, the age is 18. Uh, in Shafi'i law, it's 15, if you look at the, the tafsir of, of that verse. But in, in, in trying to write this law and uh, fix an age of marriage and discussing with the scholars, I realized that there's a sense in which we also have uh, an elite type of conversation. For all the people in this uh, forum, for example, um, none of our daughters uh, would be married before they finished secondary school, before they finished university, and they'd be 18, they'd be over 20. And it is inconceivable to us that a girl child, for example, will have nothing to do uh, be below that age. Now, as an Amir, and dealing with poor people in villages, you come across the stark reality that this issue may not even be a religious issue. It may not even be an issue with 
the scholars or with the people. We have been blaming the victim. Go to the villages in Northern Nigeria. How many villages actually have secondary schools? How many have primary schools and teachers? Now the problem, if you take, if you take a man in a village, let's say there's a primary school in the village and the girl finishes primary school at the age of 11. There's no secondary school. There's no technical, te te technical skills center. There's no provision for this girl for what she's supposed to do. Between the age of 11 and the age of 18, what is this girl doing? So, you know, we can talk about a minimum age. We can say 18, we can say 17, but tell me what will that girl be doing up to the age of 18? And you see, this is, this is where in our discourse, we need to be honest and bold. It is easy to blame poor people for marrying off their girls at the age of 12 or 13. It is more difficult to blame a governor for not providing education for girls. It is easy for us to say we are so concerned about young girls. We don't want them to get married at the age of 13 and 14. Are we not concerned that they don't have an education? Are we not concerned that they're not being taught life skills? So um, if we actually focused on the rights of every girl to an education, say up to senior secondary school, and if we held our political authorities responsible for building the schools, for providing the teachers, for providing the scholarships, once a girl finishes secondary school, she's already 18. You don't get, you don't get away from this debate about whether it is 17 or 18. If you go to the UK, if you go to the United States, if you go to Europe, all of these, um, all of these girls at, by 18, they have finished secondary school. But it is not enough to tell people, don't marry off your daughter until she's 18. What, are, what have you provided for her? So the difficult conversation we need to have is to ask ourselves, this age of marriage, and, 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 I, and you know, I went through a learning process because I became an emir with the typical elite mindset of our people in the North wanting to marry their children off. It was being an emir, coming face to face with the reality of poor people, that you realize that they, okay, they want to educate the girl, but where is the school? Or she goes to primary school and comes out and she has learned nothing. And he sees education as useless. So if we really want to deal with age of marriage, and it is important, we should deal with education for girls and insist that our girls must be educated and they must be educated up to senior secondary school. Because look, even, even now, um, there's a Universal Basic Education Act. The UBE Act makes it a legal offense for a girl to be married before she finishes junior secondary school. And it says that the imam or the pastor who contract the marriage and the parents and the house where it is contracted, all of those are offenses. How many people are brought to court for marrying off girls before they finish junior secondary school? They are not. Why? Because the schools are not there. The education has not been provided. So the person who is supposed to implement the law, the person who is supposed to take the children and, and take the parents to, to court, it is in the UB Act, yes. I saw somebody asking, yes, go and read the UB Act. The person who is supposed to sue um, the parent for marrying off his child at the age of 13 cannot sue that parent because he did not provide the school. He did not provide the teachers. And so if we see that sometimes uh, we are blaming a victim. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, people, do, people need to be enlightened, maybe educated on the dangers of child marriage. We see VVF, we see a lot of domestic violence that happens, but we must understand that the poor people in this country are victims of a system that has marginalized them. Their voices are not heard. They're crying, their children don't have an education. The villages don't have the schools, they don't have the teachers. And we need to address 
these fundamental issues of development before we can succeed in our objective as far as um, age of marriage is concerned. Now, um, but the same principle of um, uh, Mubah applies to this, uh, this whole issue of, um, of wife beating. You know, when, when you talk about um, uh, Adar, it's true, there's um, a verse of the Quran that uh, talks about how you deal with a woman in the case of Nishus, recalcitrance. And it says, And it gives this um, three um, sequential acts of um, admonition and dialogue and then um, uh, desertion from uh, uh, separation uh, from the bed. And uh, then also um, uh, this light beating. Now, it was one of the issues that we dealt with when we're trying to, to write the law. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you again, um, my position is if you look at uh, Ibn Ashur, for example, uh, Ibn Ashur in his tafsir uh, at Tahrir wa Tanwir talks about this case. He says, look, first of all, it is extremely difficult to define the scope of this beating. Um, and even if you define it, it is extremely difficult for people to remain within the scope. So, for example, if you take Maliki law, if you take the Muqtasar, the Muqtasar is very, very clear. It says that these three things are sequential. So you start with admonition. You try to talk to her. You try to uh, talk to um, uh, her, um, her parents to talk to her. If that doesn't work, then you um, d desert, um, her, or desert her bed for a period that does not exceed four months. If that doesn't work, and if you convince that a light beating will work, then you do this light beating, and this light beating is with a handkerchief or with a toothpick, um, and it cannot be, uh, it cannot hurt, it cannot injure, you must avoid the face and so on. You've got all these rules around the beating that, strictly speaking, when you read the Muqtasar, it is a symbolic act, okay, of taking a toothpick or a handkerchief and, 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 and hitting your wife with it. Now, Ibn Ashtu says, if people are unable to keep within the bounds of that symbolic act, there is nothing in Islam that stops the government from having a law that simply says you cannot beat. Because that, even if the Quran says, it is again like the case of the child marriage. It is an amr lil lil ibaha. It, 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 it permits, it does not make it true. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, in various hadith says, I have received reports that some of you beat your wives, and those who beat your wives are not the best. Uh, the, the, uh, the best of it, you, I saw a correction. Yes, uh, siwak is uh, a chewing stick, not toothpick. Uh, thanks uh, for that note. Okay, now, um, if, you, if you say that, um, so he says they are the worst of you. And if you actually look at um, the, the, the Sabah bin Nuzul, the circumstance in which that particular verse was revealed, what the Bohonna, it was the case of a woman who came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, my husband beat me. My husband slapped me. And he said, go and slap him back. That, that, was, that was the sabab. So, so the Prophet's position and the Prophet's guidance is that hitting your wife is not allowed. And therefore, no one can interpret that verse as um, meaning uh, you can beat your wife because the Prophet actually um, explicitly prohibits, prohibits you from slapping. So when we did the law, the scholars were not ready to take away uh, the, the, the right to beat, we said, okay, well, let us write what the Maliki law says. So you, so the law would provide you with the right to beat your wife with a handkerchief. But does it give, but if you slap her, it is assault. If you beat her now, I would have said, just prohibit it. But sometimes in legislation, you have to make compromise because if you don't take the scholars along, uh, man and Nur, what will happen is you pass a law and on Friday, they only stand. They stand up on 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 on, on uh, in the mosque, on the pulpit, and say that you have passed a law that um, um, that uh, undermines the verse of the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet, and you will have non-compliance. And the judges themselves will have a basis for non for not complying. The Sharia court judges. So you have to take along with you the Sharia court judges. You have to take away with you the imams. You have to take, away, to take along with you the, the, the traditional rulers. You have to get a consensus. So if they say we do not want to um, 
have a law that says it is criminal to be job. And, and you know, it's interesting in the Northern Nigeria Penal Code, and I'm, I'm sure many of you probably don't know that, it is, it is, it is, um, it is almost embarrassing, but if you go to the um, a criminal, criminal assault in the Penal Code of Northern Nigeria, it actually says, except when a man beats his wife or when a man beats his servants for the purpose of disciplining them. It is actually there in the law. So the, criminal, the penal code of Northern Nigeria actually allows a man to beat his wife. And, and so if you, if you now want to get a proper Sharia, you either have to um, criminalize it or um, come back. My view is that you should criminalize, you should stop it because at, at, at the end of the day, you know, when you look at, uh, when you talk about Tekid al Mubah, you, you must look at the Maslaha, you look at the general interests of the Ummah. It is not just, in fact, about the beating of the wife and the, uh, and the fact that the woman is brutalized, and that is uh, a human right that, that's, uh, that's violated. But uh, just think of it that in the 21st century, a community that allows wife beating is looked at as a backward community and is derogatory. Wife beating may have been okay in the 16th century, 15th century. And that was true. It was true of Muslim society, of Jewish society, of Roman society, of Greek society. But the world has moved on to a point where a community that allows its wife to be beaten is a community that is looked down upon. Now, when we are a community that prides ourselves in being Haira Ummah, the best of communities, the model society, in the interest of protecting the dignity and integrity of the Muslim community, it is imperative on Muslim leaders to make wife beating illegal. And so um, for me, um, uh, these are challenges you get when you come to legislate. Um, and and um, one, one of the things I learned was that if you try to run uh, very fast, uh, sometimes you lose the troops, you become like a general who's out there in the war and the, and the, and the troops and troops are not there. When we're having this law, we brought in scholars, we brought in uh, NGOs, uh, we, we, we brought in academics, and we sat down and debated. And like I said, the law does not have 100% of what everybody in this room would like to have, but it, is, um, but it has 80, 80%. Now, the final thing, um, um, uh, one of the notes I made here is this question of a rape victim coming and then people saying, oh, uh, she's lying. You know, Imam Ibn Qayyim in his book, Turuq al um, looks at a verse. And, and, and this verse he looks at uh, is, this verse is sort of Hujrat. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu inja akum fasikum binaba'in fatabayyun. Oh, you who believe when um, a fasik, okay, a sinner or comes to you with a story, investigate, check. And he says, look, Allah did not say, Allah did not say that when a bad person or a, a sinner or uh, an evil, when he, when he, Allah did not say when he comes with a story, reject it. He said, investigate it. Now, if you are required to investigate, to confirm, and if you investigate and find that there is corroborating evidence, if it is true, you accept it. Now he says, if you are to investigate the, 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 the statement of um, somebody who you know is a bad person, how much more when somebody who is not a bad person gives you a story? How can a girl come and say, I was raped? And without investigation, you say she's lying. In the, the Sharia is about finding the truth of an allegation. Of course, you will not hold the man and just throw him in jail because she says she raped me. But you, uh, if, you, if you take you are obliged to at least investigate that statement. Okay, where did he do it? What is your evidence? Were there any other witnesses? Take her to a doctor, let the doctor look at her. Is evidence that she was raped? Is this person known to commit these crimes? Was he there? Was he seen? Because, in, 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 I mean, in evidence, even if he was seen in that place with her at that time, and she says he raped her, 
and it's something that she was raped, he's guilty. And, and so um, the idea that people should um, reject the evidence of anyone, not talk about a rape victim, does not happen, except in the special cases where you are commanded to reject, such as when somebody comes and says, um, somebody committed adultery without four witnesses, then that is, uh, then that, then that is rejected. So uh, these are, I, th I think, um, I've tried to limit myself to the jurisprudence uh, because, um, I mean, the, the, the whole issue of the um, moral issues and ethical issues um, ha have been dealt with. Um, I, I would just round up by, by saying that um, the law only operates within the context of a society. You can have the best laws, okay? Uh, we as people have to encourage people to come out and say that they have been, um, um, they have been victims of rape. Uh, we need to have a police force. We need to have a judiciary that understands that this is something that needs to be dealt with. We need, we need, to, we need to support it. Um, I, I, I had a case uh, uh, in the palace of a woman who came to me and said um, she was battered by her husband and she went to a Sharia court judge who said, well, you know, well, um, uh, why, why, why would you bring this to court? After all, Allah allows your husband to beat you. And I, I mean, and this was a judge. He said that in open court. And we sent her to the grand cadi and said, look, you, you, need to, you need to call this, this judge to order because even if uh, you have what, what kind of beating um, is referred to in that, what kind of, of beating is accepted by jurists. But this was a Sharia court judge. So uh, you, you can have the legislation. You also have to train the, uh, the judges. You have to train the lawyers. You have to get society involved. And at the end of the day, um, we must remember that the, the whole issue of rape is also tied uh, to, to the general place of women um, in our society. I, I think um, especially, and, 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 I, and I say this from Northern Nigeria in particular, um, I, I think that we, we, do not have, we do not give women the regard and the respect that they deserve. It is the lack of respect for women that gives you that thing that makes you think you can just take your daughter without her consent and marry her off to somebody. And 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 again, if you look at someone like Ibn Qayyim in, in Zad al Ma'ad, he 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 basically has very harsh words for those who say you can even force your daughter into marriage. If you cannot, if uh, uh, if especially if she's if she's an adult, if you cannot take her wealth without her permission, how can you take her sexuality and give it to somebody? How? How can you, you cannot take her wealth without her permission, but you are allowing her to give her sexuality to a man. Why? I, I like this. So, so um, if you go to Zad al you, you'll, you, you, you'll see that. So this idea of forced marriage, that people feel they can force their daughters into marriage. And you see, this is why I keep talking about education. If you have a law that says they must go to senior secondary school, by the time she finishes secondary school, she's an adult. Once she's an adult, you have strong grounds in Islamic jurisprudence for saying even the father cannot force her into marriage. And, and so you deal with so many, um, you, you're killing so many birds with one stone by educating the girl child. And, and I think what we haven't done as a community is focus enough. And the reason I think we haven't done that is not because we don't care, but because it is politically dangerous. Because the more you talk about the failure of some to educate children, the more you point out the failure of political authorities to deliver what is important to society. We're spending our money building roads and building bridges and you know um, doing um, infrastructure where people who are walking on those roads are uneducated. They don't have health care. We need to we need to get involved in how our money is being spent. We have a budgeting process where the governor or the president just comes out and says, this year, this is how much we're going to get. We're going to spend so much on this, so much on this. Who told you that what we want is a road? Who told you that what I want is an overhead bridge? I want an education for my child. This budgeting process should begin from what are the needs of society? And if we don't have an education, we should have 30, 40% of our budget in education. If you don't have healthcare, you should have X percent in healthcare. Now we can, yes, we, we want beautiful roads, but we can, we can agree. We can, we can agree that we can defer these roads while we educate our children and then let our children, when they're educated, build the roads for themselves. 
so so the conversation and and I think where we where, I mean because I'm an economist I think the conversation where the com conversation lacks substance is that we treat it purely as a religious or cultural conversation it is a conversation about development about governance about spending priorities about making the welfare of the people truly, and this is what our constitution says, it's not, it's not me saying it, it's a constitution that says the welfare of the people is the primary objective of government of, of governance. So we cannot deal with these issues entirely without uh, discussing these difficult issues around public policy, around education, around health, and around um, gender rights um, in general, and how and how we and how we treat how we treat women. Um, I I think um, so that I, I limit myself to the uh, area that I have chosen uh, to speak about. I think I've covered um, uh, practically everything. The only thing, uh, 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 the one thing again with the domestic violence, um, I, I took my wife beating is that if you if you beat your wife in a manner that is not allowed by the Sharia, it is grounds for divorce. She can ask for divorce on those grounds. If you beat her and cause her injury, even if it is on the uh, in in a manner, for example, if you take a handkerchief to hit your wife, and she jumps in fear and falls down a staircase and breaks her leg, you are criminally liable. Even though it was a handkerchief you took, you are liable criminally. Uh, these are all stated, and, and this is not a twentieth century. These are all stated in the classical books of jurisprudence, and 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 we need to bring out all of these things and make sure that they are in our laws and make sure that our cardies implement them. Make sure that our women have somewhere to go for protection when these things happen. And, and that is where it begins. You know, uh, rape begins from, you can beat a woman, nobody cares, you can abuse her, you, you, can, you can whistle uh, at her uh, and all that. And, and, and finally, rape is not just about taking a gun or a knife um, or, or forcing her. It's also um, there are other uh, in, in Islam ikra um, is, uh, ikra has anything to do uh, that, uh, that 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 takes away consent. So if you are a teacher and and you and, and you have sex with a girl, you can't say your student. You cannot say she gave her consent because of the possibility that if she withheld her consent, uh, there, there would be consequences. And if you uncle or or um or, or some no, 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 no. boss and not say it's consensual because of the possibility that if she refused to uh, to, to have sex with you you could, uh, you, could, you, could you could you could sack her or you could um uh, or she could lose her job so so long as there's a fear of course because i'm i'm a, I'm a bit humble says that if if there's a fear that uh, that a woman can go without food or a fear that the woman can go out in the cold in the winter without shelter um, if, if she does not agree to have sex with you and, and she says she gives her consent, that is forced intercourse. Because the only reason she gave her consent is the fear that she'll go without food or she'll go. With, and, and, and if you use the same logic, anybody in a position of anybody in a position where you can hurt someone who does not accept your consent, if you have sex with her, you cannot claim consent because she does not have the option of withholding that consent without consequences. So it is rape. Now, these are the kinds of arguments that go into legislation. These are the kinds of debates that we need to have. And I'm, I'm not saying that if you had a law today, you'd have 100% of this. But if we try to get 80% of it, as we did in the, in the, in, in, in the family law, um, that would be a major step forward. And then we can, with amendments and with um, greater awareness, begin to make um, um, all those uh, all, all those amendments of Uluq Awli Hadha wa astaghfirullah ali wa lakum subhanakallah wa bihamdika shiru an la ilaha illa and astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayk I will stop there Thank you very much Sayyidi We have about 10 minutes left time enough for at least one or two questions before we have to round up um, Haji Asadit is there anything you want to you want to add first? Um, no, and yes, Your Royal Highness, <laughs> Um, I also wanted to say from this webinar, a lot of things I read on the participants' chat box is about, okay, so what action? 
So what? Now we know all this information going by all that we've had. So what? I think we have a point of takeoff. The Kano personal law, which was drafted under the leadership of His Royal Highness, is there. It is an instrument that is for the good of all. If from this kind of uh, meetings or from this movement, we can push energy behind it to get our legislators to listen. We have 12 states operating Sharia. We also have seen in other tweets that people are saying, don't bring the death penalty. People have also accused probably Islamic scholars for not telling us what we have just heard from all the people who have spoken. It looks like it is even easier to convict a criminal, a rapist under Sharia law as against common law. We need this education to go out there. We need to commit to also ensuring that we take it to the barest minimum of the localities we all live in. We need to use our influence, space of influence to educate people on what we have learned and what is in the law and to then mobilize and ask for these laws to be passed, at least in the first instance, in the 12 states operating the, the law. The trajectory that we have faced as activists and persons like His Royal Highness and others and many, many people who have tried to bring the conversation around, let's even discuss what does the religion say? The difference between what someone understands and what the religion says, what the Quran says, what the prophet did and how he handled issues has been a very, very toxic atmosphere of resilient, I mean resistance. But the, with the resilience of His Royal Highness and some of the people who have been doing this ages before we came, we have managed to move the needle. Now we can converse about marital rape. We can, we can do away with the misunderstanding of nomenclature or narratives. How can we take this further? We can take this further by studying and standing and using the platforms that we all operate to push for this law. Our political actors will always say, we are afraid of the religious leaders and the traditional leaders. Now they have spoken and they are still speaking. I can affirm to you that the Emir of, I mean, the Sarkin Jiwa is one of the people who I want to doff my hats for because within his domain, he has made it very clear that he will not accept all the things that we have been speaking to this morning. That is action. When His Royal Highness decided to pursue this, we know what he went through. For the three years we worked with him, we know what he went through, but we need the courage and conviction he exhibited to go down across constituencies and families. We also need the courage to put a nexus between our protection and our social contract with develop, I mean, with governance. If education is available, the minimum age that a girl may be contemplating marriage or her father may be contemplating marriage is probably 15, 16. But like His Royal Highness has asked, what would she be doing in the seven year bracket between 11 and 18? Mm -hmm. So it isn't so much as numbers, it is about quality of life. What quality of life will that girl have if she's left unmarried and if she's left to the vagaries of the socio-economic system she exists in? So my point and my, my last take is that we must be courageous. It is not going to be easy. The politicization of the rights of women is enough. We are tired and we need courageous leaders, both at the faith and culture level to support this process because they see the problems every day. And until we are able to galvanize and mobilize and hold our political leaders accountable to us for the protection we deserve from the constitution and from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we remain where we are. Thank you and bisalam. Thank you very much, Hajia. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Aidi, just one more final question before we wrap up. Um, there there is a command from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when it comes to hudud punishments where he says Udru alil hudud alil mu'minina bishuhabat bishuhabat wa in mujatilahu makhrajan fa khalihan hasibiyya fa innahu khayran al-hakiman yukhtan fil afwuh min al-yukhtah fil shadda 
ward off the hudud punishments from the believers as much as possible. If you find a way out for them, do let them go. For it is better that the judge err in mercy than they err in severity. I ask this question because I've come across cases where um, there is a case of sexual violence or rape that happened several years ago, but has only come to light recently. And the judge or the Qadi that the case is brought to will use this reasoning to say that um, the time has passed or that the person has already repented. Therefore, we should pass over judgment on this person. Um, how, how, how do we solve this issue? Okay, let, let me take that because I think it's, it's an interesting um, conversation. Now, now, first of all, I, 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 you know, one of the reasons I said we should not have rape um, in, uh, in, in Sina is precisely because of these kinds of protections. Um, the idea is, uh, well, as you said, the Hadith basically has those two things. First of all, if there is any kind of doubt, you should not have the had. Now, um, but not having the had does not mean you cannot have ta'adhir because yeah. there are two types of punishment. There's, there's a had punishment, which is a fixed punishment of Sharia. There's also a deterrent punishment. Okay, so um, when, when you do not have, um, when, when something has not reached the level of had, it still does not mean it's going to be punished with a, with a, lower, with a lower punishment. That's the first thing. The second um, thing with rape is, I, I think it's important that victims also understand uh, the law and their rights. In general, um, the Islamic law um, makes it more and more difficult if you allow, especially in crimes like rape, when you allow too much time to pass. And I think it's the same everywhere. Um, if, you, if you're in the UK and you're raped and, and you don't report immediately and you report after six months, the details become fuzzy. You ask, or maybe you can't remember whether he was wearing a red shirt or, you know, uh, and all that. And then you get into also, by the time the police are interviewing you, you give one story now, another story, um, um, different. That basically defeats your case in a court of law. Not because you were not raped, but because the time that has lapsed means that your memory is not clear enough and your testimony is therefore faulty. So even though Islamic law accepts the testimony of a rape victim, that testimony is actually best given as soon as possible after the act. No. And, and, and so it's extremely important that these things are reported. Also, the circumstantial evidence that you get, if you want to get semen, if you want to get um, um, DNA evidence, you do it immediately after the act. If you wait after one year, um, you know, and all that, and, and, the, and, the, and the specimens have been corrupted, you find that even um, the medical evidence um, does not work. Those are all grounds for having doubts, okay, about um, uh, uh, about your um, uh, about about the about the uh, genuineness of the testimony. And, and the reality is, in every law, you cannot um, punish someone if you do not uh, if you are not convinced that he's guilty. So um, I don't think it is something that should be used as an excuse. Um, to, to let um, criminals get away. But I think it's important for victims to also make sure that um, their testimony is given um, as soon as possible and that um, they get as much circumstantial evidence uh, as possible. And, 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 I, and also I think the neighborhood um, helps because if, if you're a witness, if you heard something, if you saw something, you should be able to go out and say, this girl speaks the truth because I, I heard her scream, I looked out of my window, and I saw this man running away, you know? Um, if she tore a part of his shirt, somebody should say, yes, I can confirm that this is his shirt. You know, I, I've seen him wear it. So we, we need to have, uh, to, to have that, kind of, uh, that kind of support. But, but that rule itself is something that um, is aimed at making sure that you don't cut off the hand of a man and you don't kill a man if you have doubt, um, um, and usually um, for, for this. Type. I don't know if Sheikh Noor would like to add uh, some, something to that. No, I think you said it all. Jazakallah khairan. <clears throat> all right. Jazakallah khairan, Sayyidi. Thank you, everyone, for partaking in this webinar today. Um, before we close off, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn on the cameras so that we can have a screenshot of everyone that was present. Yeah.
Yes, who's that? Yes, thank you very much. I just heard it too. All right, I think that's everyone. Okay. Um, yes, Eddie, would you like to give us the closing prayer? Which of the say <laughs> You, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I defer to, to, to Imam. Uh, Imam, please. Uh, uh, Imam, um, Imam, Imam, okay. Uh, okay. So, Salam ala Nabi al Karim. Salam ala Nabi al Karim. We thank Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for having all the great uh, scholars and our brothers in the Christianity. For a wonderful presentation, we want to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love you, we love you, we love you, we love That Allah has brought us to these conclusions. We have all learned from this program. No matter the imamship, no matter the leadership, no matter where one works or whatever one is doing, we have learned from one another. I want to say that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy, Accept all this from all of us as an act of righteousness. We just say, No, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and ask, also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us opportunity to be able to come back with this program so that we can learn more, we can see more, so that this information can go around. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the organizers, may Allah bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to elevate you and make the organization to grow from strength to strength. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وكفر لنا وارحمنا إنك أنت الغفور الرحيم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تكفر لنا وترحمنا كنا من الخاسرين ربنا كفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وفقد أقدامنا وردنا على الكوم الكافرين اللهم نجنا مع الناجين ولا تهلكنا مع الهالكين اللهم نجنا مع الناجين ولا تهلكنا مع الهالكين اللهم نجنا وعن ناجين ولا تهلكنا مع الهالكين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار توفنا مسلمين ومنين فائزين متكين ولكنا بالصالحين اللهم اغفر لنا قبل الموت وارحمنا بعد الموت ولا تعذبنا يوم القيامة اللهم ختمنا بكلمة لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Rev Reverend, okay. Reverend Joseph, could you please give Thank us the closing prayer from the side? Hello? Reverend Joseph, you're muted. You're muted. Yes. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you have kept us here for four hours dealing with the issues that bother us as a nation and as Muslims and Christians in this part of the country. We thank you for the organizers of this program and therefore they put in place so that others will be educated this manner. I pray that our con individual contributions made here today will go a long way in solving issues as it has to do with gender based violence, rape, divorce, family affairs, training of our children, and how to solve some other vices that are besetting our nation. When families are in order, the nation will be in order. And when families are in chaos, then there is no orderliness in the nation. Therefore, invoke your presence to enter into each family, enter into affairs of our nation, and bless each one of us so that we can have perfect nation. And as it has to do with women, Father, may those who are sensitive 
as to solve problems of women in our nation, not just be few, but may all of us see and lift the women folk from the position of looking down on them to the position whereby they will have a kind of acceptance in all societies and their say and move and opinion will be recognized. This is our prayer today. As we ask you to dismiss us with your blessing, in Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend. Um, finally, to our audience, I'd like to remind you that you can follow us on all our social media handles. That is M-A-R-S-V, Mars V, Nigeria, Mars V, Nigeria, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Sorry, Faiz, uh, just to mention very quickly that we have gotten a special request to have right. final words from Mufti Mangfis. Yes. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Actually, alhamdulillah, I, I don't really have anything to add. I'm just so impressed that the discussion has been so public, so clear. Uh, such revered people have spoken in such an eloquent, clear-cut manner, and I think it needs to continue. The follow-up also needs to continue, and uh, I am definitely proud to have been a part of this uh, panel today, and thank you so much to everyone who made this happen. I think more of this needs to happen, and the follow-up is very, very important. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Sheikh. Right. Thank you, Mufti. Please do not oh, forget okay. to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our Twitter account it is at MarsV underscore NG. And on Facebook, where we streamed live today, it is M-A-R-S-V. And our Instagram account is at MarsV underscore NG. We will be making all the videos and all the discussions that happened today available to the public. Um, so please stay tuned with us on our social media pages while we um, do this for you. Thank you all once again. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you in Lagos, Omina. Mufti, it's good to see you. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. I mean, in Abuja. Inshallah. Thank you, Reverend Father. Abaka Sadiq, Imam Sharaf. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.